global crowd today and how amazing this session is going to be welcome 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 everybody we are doing somewhat of a uh, stakeholder interviews with a twist shadow session if you will so no worries if you're only able to listen this is really going to be me and evelyn jumping in conducting an interview and then y'all will be um asking questions along the way dd hi from maryland hi my husband is from maryland and janine is here as well hello janine oh, okay i'm so excited everybody uh to be with you here today this is the first skills challenge that we've done all this week so i miss everybody but in any case i will stop rambling let us introduce the amazing Evelyn McGuire. I know those of you who have met Evelyn, absolutely, absolutely, let's celebrate them. Evelyn, wanna go ahead and introduce yourself to our learners today. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Evelyn. Uh, you may have seen me uh, on LinkedIn. I also have a blog, another salesforceblog.com, currently a senior Salesforce developer at Cash App. I have been all over the Salesforce ecosystem the last few years. I've done ISV partner work and a lot of consulting work, which is what I'm going to be drawing from today. So very excited to uh, walk through some difficult stakeholder conversations with y'all. Absolutely. And Evelyn is also writing a book now on lightning web components. If you don't follow them on LinkedIn slash the blog, you got to do that. All right, here's what we're gonna do today. We'll do a brief overview into what clicked experiences are slash what is a shadow session. We will talk through what we're going to be doing today and then we will conduct a live interview. I will be playing the role of the stakeholder. It's going to be very odd. Please don't compare me to Mo and Dazelle who are practiced and do this in their every day to day life. My name is Rosemary, I'm just a business owner that's that's all I know so thank you all for your patience um, and we'll be taking breaks along the way so that Evelyn can explain the thought process behind what should I be doing here how can I salvage this how can I you know help the stakeholder to see that they are being ridiculous without telling them that they are being ridiculous and then finally we will do some Q&A and reflection everyone always ask your questions, put those interactions along the way. When we take the little breaks, then we will kind of go in and interact with all of you in the chat and then pick up the interview from there. Here at Clicked, we learn from each other. It is co-created, it's discussion and feedback today. It is you all watching and participating actively. It is a safe space to try. Today is mm, somewhat of a high stakes conversation. We want to show you all what it looks like to manage stakeholder expectations, to salvage that relationship. And when things go terribly, terribly wrong, how to keep your cool and remain professional. And of course, have fun. This is gonna be an absolute blast. So happy to have you all participating today. What is a shadow session? A shadow session is where we have a clicked coach come in and demonstrate a skill. Demonstrate a skill that they would practice in their day-to-day -day life, in a Salesforce instance or a Salesforce you know, consulting project, which is what we are doing today. So this is really a watching and uh, participating, not through sharing your work is what we do in the shadows or skills challenges, but by watching throughout the experience. If you have questions, put them in the Q&A section and we will answer questions at the end. So let's talk about stakeholder management. We could talk about this all day, <laughs> but Evelyn, before we jump in, what are some you know quick thoughts that come to your head when you see those words, stakeholder management? So one of the biggest lessons that I have learned in regards to 
interacting with stakeholders is things can get really high stakes really fast. And it's important to remember not to take things personally. Um, sometimes things get heated. Sometimes things are a little down. Sometimes things are very serious. It's important to not let that weigh on your soul, on your heart, on your mind. Um, just remember that everyone is doing the best they can with the information that they have at the time. And uh, it really helps to not take things super personally. So um, I have been in some stakeholder meetings that have gone off the rails. Uh, we want to make sure that we are uh, always speaking to people at the level that they are at. Um, and there is a fine line. One thing I like to tell people, there is a fine line between talking to someone intelligently who may not have all the information versus dumbing things down or speaking in layman's terms. So you want to speak technically, but in a way that your stakeholder is going to understand and don't dumb things down for them because dumbing things down kind of means you're talking down to someone. So there's a really fine line between those things, but I like to call that out because uh, it's, the difference between speaking to someone intelligently who may not have all the information versus dumbing things down uh, is, again, a very fine one. But it that line is what defines a great stakeholder interview versus a not so great stakeholder interview. Yeah. And and inter Ro Rohan asked the question, talking up to them, what, how, how would you describe it? Right. You, you, you kind of said layman's terms. Uh, so you definitely want to speak in a way that you're getting your point across. Um, talking up to them, putting them on a pedestal is also something you kind of want to avoid. You want to bring yourself down to the same level and make sure that they are understanding. And as Janine asks, uh, what about when someone says, explain it to me like I'm four? Uh, that is kind of an idiom that we use in our uh, you know, in our popular culture, explain it like I'm five is a big uh, subreddit. It's uh, one of my favorites, actually. But uh, we are all professionals here. We are talking to each other as professionals. And we want to explain it in a way that a professional that might not know the most about Salesforce can understand it. So we want to avoid using Salesforce specific jargon like FLS is field uh, or FSL, excuse me, field service lightning. We want to use the full word, uh, not use acronyms, not use super jargony stuff and uh, speak to them as equal collaborators, like Marissa said in the comments. Awesome. Awesome. OK, let's dive in then. We will kind of come up with questions along the way as we go. Let's see if I I think they dropped the lightning of us. If using acronyms, make sure to explain the acronym. Yeah, there we go. Let, let's see if we have an opportunity to do that along the way. All right. With that, everyone, let's get started. Evelyn is now a Salesforce consultant, and my name is Rosemary Sanders. I am the Chief Franchise Officer at Cosmic Candles. Let's begin the interview. Evelyn, I will pass the mic over to you. So Rosemary, how can I help you today uh, with your Salesforce work? Oh, sorry, everyone. I forgot to say. <laughs> this is a very classic example of someone being thrown into a project at the last minute. Unfortunately, one of Evelyn's colleagues got sent to the hospital at the last minute and they sent Evelyn in to save the day. So Evelyn has been briefly you know, shown the project requirements etc but they're just really coming in and using their their expertise to to uh handle this interview do the sunglasses make the persona yes marissa exactly when i've got the sunglasses on i am rosemary and when i take them off i am rachel okay with that i will answer your question which was tell me about your salesforce project oh yeah Okay, so what we're doing here at Cosmic Candles, we obviously have been very successful. I built this business from the ground up and I take a lot of pride in that. And I am really just honored to be able to build this out to the rest of the country and have people opening franchises and things like that. So obviously the old CMR that we were using 
isn't quite going to work because we're going to have so many different franchises, but I want to be able to help my team adapt as much as possible to the new uh, Salesforce org. And what that means is that I want everything to look as similar as possible to the old system um, and obviously be good for franchise management. But then I need to be able to like still be the CEO and stuff like that. So, yeah. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. And what I'm going to do just uh, so folks know, um, I'm going to break down my thought process of what uh, what Rosemary has just said. So the uh, process that we are going to go into is we wanna make sure that the user interface in Salesforce looks like the previous CRM there. And uh, we don't wanna call out that uh, CMR was used. Um, I noticed that as well, but we want to make sure that we're not uh, talking down to our stakeholders as well. Um, we are the experts in the situation, but it is our job to collaborate with our stakeholders to make a functional and beautiful product, right? So uh, we want to make sure that we are meeting folks where they're at, and we want to make sure that uh, they feel like they are uh, being being uh, respected and that they their knowledge is validated as well. So uh, we want to make sure that uh, if there's any mis mishaps, mishaps, slip ups, um, we, we're just going to roll with it, right? So um, the thing that I would like to call out about this is, again, we want to make sure the user interface is the same. Uh, we also heard a little bit about a role hierarchy where Rosemary is at the top of the role hierarchy as the CEO. And then we're going to start thinking about how we're going to divide up the franchises into that role hierarchy. So um, that's something I'd like to call out there. Putting on my uh, interviewer hat, uh, we can say something along the lines of, okay, that sounds great. Um, I definitely appreciate that you've built out this business. This has been a wonderful journey. I've been following y'all on Instagram and Facebook. It's been really fun to watch. Um, so as we are discussing how we want to uh, make sure that the new system looks like the old system, what would that look like for you? And what would that mean for you as a stakeholder? Yeah, so first off, currently the way that we are collecting orders, it's pretty simple. When a customer goes in to order a candle, they can just choose all of the ones that they want and then it takes them to the next page and then they can select like the sizes and the features and stuff like that. And our team really loves that because um, it makes it easy to collect orders. Like when it comes in on the back end, all like what we see is just like basically um, a drop down list of all of the candles that they've ordered. And then we can see like a checkbox and we can just, you know, select this is the size they want, this is the scent they want, and then send it over. So that would be the first thing that I really would want to keep is making it easy for my team to see which candles have been ordered by people just like for you know customer relation management and working with our clients and also making that checkout process as smooth as possible uh, also i think it should be easy for us to you know get data from the different franchises when we can see all of the different kinds of candles and they can just you know select them and then select the sizes and we can see you know which franchise is having you know is one selling a lot of vanilla and then the other is having you know a lot of like peach bellini scented candle you know different parts of the country are going to have different preferences so that would be the number one feature that i would like to transfer over Awesome. So some of the things that I pull out of this conversation that we're having with Rosemary is that they want to be able to, uh, they want kind of a custom front end on this. So uh, some of the things that would be suggested in this uh, scenario where we are selecting multiple things at one time, oftentimes uh, stakeholders will suggest a multi-select pick list, which is, as a lot of us know, not necessarily best practice in Salesforce. They are the option for multi select pick list is available, but if you have ever worked with a multi select pick list in Apex, you know that it is a list of common separated values. So we have our peach Bellini candles, we have our midnight fragrance candles, we have our uh, dark moonlight candles or whatever. Uh, and those are all shown on the back end as a comma separated list. So 
Uh, Multi-select pick lists are kind of hard to work with. So as the consultant in this scenario, I'm gonna try and steer away from that and we might be able to build something a little more custom for this. So uh, this is another, let's see, another thing that I call, I would like to call out is we have the uh, number of check boxes where we have, uh, we have our candle fragrances, our candle scents, and then we have the size of candles as well. So what I am envisioning for something like this is if we can, uh, we can do a, uh, let me think about options for this. So if we wanted to, we could do a custom lightning web component for this that would have a uh, iterable component that would show like this is candle number one, candle number two, candle number three, and we have the size with a, uh, probably radio buttons rather than a checkbox. A radio button is gonna say that we have, uh, these are our options in the set. Each of the radio buttons are uh, one of four options. If we have an eight ounce size, 12 ounce, 24 ounce, 32 ounce, for example, those would be in our radio select. Whereas the checkboxes um, would be, uh, each checkbox is a true or false value. So we could do a radio button that would, uh, have the set of our sizes versus a checkbox, which is a true or false. And then we also want to uh, possibly do this. Um, a lot of products are, you know, we can put them in as a product and say, okay, we have this opportunity here and we are going to use our price books that has each candle individually. So um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ways we can go with this, but uh you know, custom lightning web component we can uh, that would front end on the opportunity products and the products. But um, I love the uh, I love the the way we can the multiple ways we can go with this. And um, part of being a consultant is like digging in and asking those questions to figure out. Okay, now which we know there's a couple of different options of where we can go with this. Uh, we definitely want to uh, ask some more questions here. And Rohan asks, um, the al alternative solution to multi-select, but what if the customer doesn't want to use custom code? Um, so we don't actually need to use custom code for the solution. I'm a developer, so my brain goes to Lightning Web Components immediately. But um, there's a lot of benefits to not using multi-select pick lists uh, as, a, as a declarative developer or an admin as well. So uh, being able to... Uh, go in and say, okay, the multi-select pick list is hard to work with in flows. It is hard to work with in uh, our process builders and workflow rules, rest in peace to those two uh, declarative options, but they still exist in some Salesforce orgs, so I'd like to call them out. And uh, this is something that uh, because it's a comma separated value in the multi-select pick list, you have to process it differently than a regular uh, pick list value. So um, that is something that, uh, again, more questions to be asked to, this, to the stakeholder. So jumping back into, uh, you know, I'm doing kind of the office thing where I'm looking at the camera telling you all what I'm thinking. Jumping back to our stakeholder, Rosemary, I'm going to ask some more questions to see what kind, how do we narrow down our front end solution for what we're going to do? So Rosemary, you are talking to us about uh, having an option to select different candles and we are discussing uh, check boxes as well to say what size. Um, I would like to suggest the, uh, rather than doing check boxes, if we have a radio bot, uh, radio button, excuse me, um, the difference between them will be the check box is the square and the radio buttons are the little circles on the user interface. And the benefit of using a radio button is we will have a defined set of sizes that we can say. So we have the, uh, you know, we have our eight ounce candles, our 12 ounce, our 24 and our 32. And those sets will be defined so that instead of having, is this candle a eight ounce true or false? Is this candle a 12 ounce true or false? Um, it'll say this is eight, 12, 24, or 32. And then what we can do is we can have a drop down box that allows you to select the fragrance of the candle that will um, that will kind of reduce the load on the amount of it'll reduce the cognitive load on the automations that you have to do. So 
in the flows that you've written in your Salesforce org, um, what we can do is we can say, we have this value and we have our peach bellini candles. We want it as a 12 ounce. And then this will be nice to handle in the flows that you've built. And we'll be able to automate that. So we can say, okay, for your subscriptions coming from this franchise, we can automatically create that order nice and easily with the single pick list value and the radio buttons. So how does that sound? So, you know, I've been in this business for a long time. I, I consider myself to be pretty good with technology in general. Um, I'm not totally sure what you're describing. And since I'm not sure, I'm not sure that my team would know, you know, like they're just so used to the drop down and the checklist. It's so simple. Um, yeah. How can, how can we make that work so that they don't have to adjust to it so much? Absolutely. So this is something, uh, this is an example of a stakeholder kind of pushing back on something that I've said. So what I am going to do is we're going to take their feedback and say, okay, they want their end users to be able to have this, uh, we want to have this conversation and it's going to be a back and forth and we want to make sure that the end users and the uh the franchisees for example in this scenario are able to quickly transition from their previous crm tool into salesforce so what we're going to do um in this situation this is some this is a uh time where i would sit down and say okay can i sit with your end user and watch how they do their job and one of the most important things you can do as a consultant, developer, admin, any anything in the Salesforce ecosystem is actually sit with your end user. So I'm going to say, OK, I understand your concerns with the uh, transition from the previous CRM into Salesforce. Um, am I able to sit with your with your end users and see how they perform their job duties so that we can note their pain points? see if there is anything we can improve for your end users, and then we'll be able to make sure that uh, we combine uh, we combine the best features of your previous CRM with the cap capabilities of Salesforce to find something that works best for your end users. Yeah, that would be really good. That would be really good. I'm sure, you know, I've, I've heard that Salesforce can do absolutely everything. And so from oh, that standpoint, right, it's like, I just want everything to be exactly the same. If Salesforce can do everything and more for each of the franchises, then I just want what I already have. But, you know, I get it. It's probably a little bit more complicated than that. So definitely, you know, you, you can sit with them and, and we'll go from there and have a conversation after. Yeah. Excellent. That sounds great. So cool. what are some of your other concerns? Yeah. So, you know, you had mentioned the flows that we had built. And one of the things that we have right now as a pain point is sometimes, you know, a customer emails in and they call in or whatever, and we can save our case. But sometimes our cases just get lost. And it's like, wait a second, who called in? What did they update? And we don't really have a way to track that. So, I was thinking that we can have an automated workflow that sends out an email to the customer and also to the service rep every time they like place an order or if the customer goes into their dashboard and they say like one of my favorite candles that I really love to order is like the the forbidden fig candle and then they change it and they say actually i'm looking for more of the like the piney sense and so i'm gonna go, i, I want to switch over to that so they can edit it in, the, in their dashboard and we really want an automated email like to go out or at least for the customers to have an ability to select every single kind of email that they would want to be sent when i update my preferences when i place an order when i make a case when i get a follow-up like all of those things just automate all of them so that we never have to lose track of any conversation that happens ever and also like our customer base is growing right so i don't want to have to go into the system and when someone calls in is like hey what ha what happened i don't want to look it up i want them to be able to look it up absolutely 
So my thought process on this is this sounds like something that a community site would be helpful for in the uh, Salesforce suite of products. We would be able to say, okay, we have this external, uh, we have these customers, we want them to be able to log in, manage their own cases. I'm also hearing that we could be able to use a uh, web to case form. So if we have a customer that wants to uh, reach out to us to say, okay, we have, I have an issue with my forbidden fig candle. I want the the piney, the shady pines uh, candle scent instead. <laughs> Rachel and I are having too much fun with this. I'm laughing so hard. Uh, but if we want the piney scent over the forbidden fig, we are going to say, okay, we have this uh, in the standard web to case functionality. What we can do is build a form with the help of Salesforce, put it on a page on our website and have them just type in their, their concerns with the candles. We can have a drop down that has the fragrances and um, have them uh, send that in and it'll automatically uh, pass that back to us. So um, one of the benefits here is Salesforce can keep track of all different types of conversations that are had. Um, and that's something that as the consultant, I'm going to call out to our Rosemary stakeholder to say, okay, uh, one of the benefits of Salesforce is we can keep track of every email that's sent. We can keep track of every call. We can keep track of all of our uh, internal comments as well using chatter. So coming back to Rosemary, I'm going to say something along the lines of that sounds great. Salesforce is just the tool for that. We have the ability to build a case from a web form that'll be hosted on your website to say, okay, my name is this, my email address is this, and then we are going to do some work uh, with the flows on the back end to say, okay, we're going to use this email address, we're going to match it to an existing customer. And then if we don't have that email addresses, uh, if we don't have that email address safe, we'll create a new customer with that email address and we'll try and pair uh, order numbers if they have their order numbers. So we can do some duplicate uh, matching, duplicate removal and matching based on the email address and order number that's provided by the customer, which will allow us to reduce the number of duplicate cases as well as match that case to our uh, order object within our Salesforce org. So one of the other things that was called out is we want to do all of this automatically. So one of the benefits of having a community site and a community portal within Salesforce is a customer can come in and using their username and password, we can, uh, we can have them log in and set their email preferences within this community site. So that is something that we are definitely capable of. Okay, so I guess what I was envisioning is um, I was doing some research on Salesforce. <laughs> I like to be as prepared as possible. I didn't hear about the web to case, so that's kind of cool. What I was reading about though was um, workflow rules. So we could maybe set some of those up for when something changes or you know when they submit the web to case, we can set up a workflow rule to send it like a reminder to our case, uh, our customer managers or whatever, or maybe to our invent inventory processing system. I think that would be really cool too. Cause like I said, like just as many automated emails as possible would be really nice. Awesome. So my uh, thought process here is workflow rules are scheduled to be deprecated. They still work in existing orgs where the workflow rules are already there. But we need to uh, we need to educate our stakeholder and say, you know, that's we love that you did the research. I love having a, a conversation with an informed stakeholder. But unfortunately, workflow rules are no longer. We're actually going to do the same thing as a workflow rule, but we're going to build it in a record trigger flow. So this is something that uh, this is again. We are going to uh, not dumb it down. We're not going to speak down to our stakeholder. We are going to have the uh, we're going to have the conversation. We're going to make it level to level, and we are speaking as colleagues here, right? We're on the same level. We are, you know, I'm talking to the CEO of a company. I'm technically below them in level, right? And we have to think of it that way. So, um, coming back into Rosemary, uh, we'll say. 
thank you for doing that research, Rosemary. That's really awesome and helpful that you were able to find that. Um, so unfortunately, Salesforce is, oh gosh, I had a brain fart there. If you ever have a brain fart and you like take a second to pause and think, um, try not to use ums and uhs to fill the space, but uh, a good time, let me think on that for a second, will help you if you ever like freeze like I just did. So um, I, I'll just be honest with y'all. I have, oh, Rohan calls out drink water. That's another good one as well. Um, but I have really bad anxiety. So, uh, I, I, I actually, I just want to like be honest with y'all. I have, uh, anxiety and this, uh, these stakeholder conversations make me nervous. So, uh, just a tip, drink some water. Uh, let me think on that for a second. Let me do some research and get back to you. Those are all some good phrases. Um, if you ever pause like that, like I did and just lose your mind, cause I, I blanked out for a second there, but okay. So going into back to our stakeholder conversation with Rosemary, we are currently explaining that the workflow rules are a great solution for orgs that already have them. But unfortunately, Salesforce has decided to uh, deprecate them. So what that means is they can exist in orgs where they have already been built, but we cannot unfortunately build new workflow rules. Thankfully for us, Salesforce has replaced the functionality of the workflow rule with something called a record triggered flow. So the flow is a really handy tool that I think your end users are going to love. And what it does is we build a we build a visual chart and kind of a flow map and we'll drag and drop our pieces to say, OK, when this record is changed, we are going to send an email and we can actually use flow uh, to make a call out to the inventory system as well. So uh, this is a new feature in Salesforce that's been added in the last couple of years. Now we can have the uh, now we can have the ability to make that call out to our external system as well. OK, yeah, that works for me. I mean, as long as as long as the problem gets solved, it is, in fact, I know less important how it's done, but I, I do kind of like to understand what's going on as well. Um, taking some responsibility as we, you know, expand and, and, and stuff like that. All right, cool. So that one is checked off. The next one, a little bit more complicated, but what we've wanted to do, you know, we're expanding on our franchises and we also want to offer a new product to people where they can actually customize their own candles and make their own candle scent and put it out in, into the community, they can put their name, they can put their, um, you know, flavor profile, if you will, um, for feedback in the community and stuff like that. But then also they can just order a custom candle. So we want to implement something where a customer can place an order and they can have, you know, just basically checkbox what they want, what's the color, what's the size, what's the wax type, and then our sales and customer team and our, you know, um, what's it called? Warehouse can get going on making that as soon as possible and offering like expedited shipping because this is definitely a premium feature for our top tiered subscribers. Not everyone's going to have access to this, especially in the beginning. It's just going to be way too much. So, um, yeah, being able to offer that to our top tier customers to make that custom candle with anything that they want and then also like order a little sample before because you probably don't want to you know order a big candle and then end up having it be terrible and have to return it and all the things so awesome and so this is one of the situations where a checkbox uh my thought process is a checkbox actually makes sense in this because we want to say okay if we want the pine flavor or the pine scent, excuse me, we don't eat candles. Uh, we have the pine scent, we have the fig scent, we have the peach bellini scent, and we want to make sure that we have a, uh, we want to make sure that we're adding the, the scents and mixing the scents. Um, we want to say, okay, this vanilla scent, true. We have cardamom scent is true. We have, I don't know what other, I'm thinking of spices right now, but clove is true. So we want to make sure that we have the uh, option to say, okay, if all of these are true, we want to mix these flavors into the candle. I keep saying flavors. Why am I saying flavors? Whatever. 
Anyways, it makes sense. Uh, it just makes yeah. sense, you know? <laughs> Anyways, we have all of our, uh, now that we have all of our scents that are going to go in, uh, this is an oper awesome opportunity for, uh, again, the use of the products and opportunity products in Salesforce. We can say the have, <laughs> oh, I'm glad that we don't eat candles, Evelyn McGuire, 2024. Y'all are making me laugh. Uh, luckily, when you're in these stakeholder conversations, another tip that I have, turn your Slack off, pause the notifications, because again, I'm a little distracted right now. There's a lot going on. So uh, always try to make sure your emails, um, just a little pro tip uh, career-wise, I try to check my email maybe four times a day, like once in the morning, once before lunch, once after lunch, and once at the end of the day. If I know that there is an important email that I'm waiting on, I will check my email when I expect it to come in. But rather than pulling up my email, sitting and waiting for that email, getting distracted, um, I set a little timer or I block off 15 minutes at a time to check my check my email, check my Slack, so I'm not just constantly distracted by it. So um, that's just a little piece of advice. If that works for you and you're a person who is able to multitask, I am personally not, most people are not. Um, I like to throw that piece of advice out there. Block off time specifically to say, okay, I'm gonna check the chat uh, while Rachel is talking. I'm gonna check my email once this call is done. And then uh, that'll help you stay focused during your stakeholder meeting so you don't get distracted like I just did. Um, and uh, Bunting asked a really good question. So as a BA or a functional consultant, uh, how to determine how technical you would be with the stakeholder? A VP level stakeholder may not care uh, how technical we have to get. They just want to see the holistic solution, right? Um, and an everyday user, end user is going to be more hands-on. Um, we are going to say, uh, this is something that I like to research my stakeholder before I talk to them. So I will actually look at their LinkedIn profile. I'll do a little Google search. Um, I will do my research to say, okay, I am talking with a developer today. I am talking with a business analyst today. I am talking with the end user. So uh, if we are talking to our end user, we're not going to care so much about the technical details. They don't need to know that uh, a multi-select pick list is a comma separated value on the back end. Uh, that, that's something that the CTO might know about. They might care about. A developer is definitely going to care about. So um, this is something that uh, you are going to have to determine how technical to be while we have the, uh, most of the times you'll know who you're talking to before the meeting. So look them up in the company, in the company profile, see if they have a bio, see if they have a bio in Salesforce, look them up on LinkedIn, uh, know your stakeholder. And this is something that you have to make that determination, um, not only before the meeting starts, but also as the meeting is progressing. So if my technical stakeholder, if my end user actually does care about the technical details, I might have to make a snap decision to say, okay, I'm going to be a little more technical with this end user. And uh, that's something that you have to constantly be adjusting as you're going. So um, it helps to have like, if you have a slide deck, I like to have my technical notes at the top so that I know what I'm talking about. And then my, uh, in the comments, not like on the actual slide, but if I, if I prepared a slide deck to say, okay, here's what we're doing. Uh, here is my suggestions for your org. Um, I'll have technical notes in the, in the, uh, presenter notes. And then I'll have like the, the more, the less technical notes as well. So we'll say, okay, this is what it looks like on the back end up top. This is what it looks like in the front end on the bottom. And then that way I have pre preparations for both levels of technical versus non-technical stakeholders, if that makes sense. So um, going back to uh, my thought process on this, uh, normally I would oh, also be taking sorry, notes. Oh, yeah. oh but before that, yeah, I just wanna add one more thing into bunting. Um, is because Rosemary was talking about technical features, right? She's done her research. She's talking about things that are probably multi-select pick lists or check boxes. So she is interested in the technical, which is why Evelyn started to speak to that. It was a little bit less layman's term. And then also 
Evelyn started talking about flows and things and radio buttons and Rosemary was kind of like, what? But Evelyn wasn't exactly. like, oh, is that too technical? I'm so sorry. Let me we just rolled with it and didn't like make me feel like, oh, I guess I'm not as smart as I thought because <laughs> no business owner wants to hear that. Okay, back to the interview. Those are really good call outs. So um, again, you want to meet your you want to meet your uh, your stakeholder where they're at. Again, do your research before the meeting. Uh, find out who you're talking to if if you're able to. Ask the person who set up the meeting for a little bit of information on the person if you can't find them on LinkedIn. And then constantly be adjusting. Um, again, like I said, I like to have my technical notes, my non technical notes, and kind of blend the two based on who I'm talking to. So. Um, that is something that, uh, really helpful when talking to stakeholders, because you want to kind of gas up your stakeholder. They know the most about their product. I'm just building something for them. They are honestly the expert. I need to defer to them and meet them where they're at. So, so yeah. And then I forgot what we're talking about because my other, my other piece of advice is you should be taking notes throughout your entire stakeholder meeting. And I am uh, not doing that because I was trying to do this off the cuff. So I forgot what we were talking about. So always take notes. Yeah. Does anyone remember what we were talking about? Cause I lost my train of thought as well. I think you were going to go back into talking about why checkboxes might be a good thing and what we could do about it. Oh, yeah. So this is the thought process here um, is we have uh, because we have all the check boxes, we can say, OK, we want to add the, <laughs> the custom candle flavoring and we want to make sure that our all of our flavors are selected for our candles that we're definitely not eating because it's 2024. But uh, we're going to take all of that information and aggregate it. And again, this is a little technical. Uh, this is probably something that I would talk to the developer about and not the stakeholder. CEO doesn't care. We're aggregating the data. We're doing this. But the CEO is going to care. OK, because we can aggregate this data, we can now build a report and a dashboard to say, OK, your most popular scents of candles in this region are your pine, your fig, and your cardamom. Your most popular scents in this region are the uh, apple, the pumpkin spice, and the floral. And then because we have this information that we have gathered, uh, again, uh, in a conversation with the developer, I'm going to be more technical. But because I have had this conversation with the developer, I can say, OK, the CEO is going to want to know about uh, what's, what flavors are most likely to be returned in this region. So we can say, OK, these scents might not go well together. Uh, this candle is most commonly returned. And then uh, we can kind of guide our end users to say, OK, we want to kind of steer away from this. We want to steer into this. And we can really guide the end user experience uh, with that data we've aggregated on the back end as well. And um, I also, uh, going into the, uh, into the chat, I noticed uh, we're talking about recording the meetings. Always, always, always ask for uh, consent to record. So um, one of the biggest things like at multiple companies I've been at, you actually have to ask because everyone, not everyone lives in a two party consent state. Um, or, and obviously folks live in different countries as well. Um, in the United States, there's something called a one party consent state where only one party has to consent to recording. And there's also two party consent states where everyone has to consent to the recording. So in most corporate environments, you'll have to actually ask people, is it okay for me to record? Thumbs up, thumbs down. And then we'll see if we're able to record. Um, on this note, uh, it is not usually advised to use an AI note taker. And this is something that uh, there's, Depending on the company, a lot of companies have AI note takers and everyone in the call must consent to being processed through an AI note taker. Um, so always ask for consent if you're using an AI note taker. I personally love them. Um, they're very helpful for me, but 
I'm not going to bring that to a work meeting because I need to get consent of everyone. I have to get security reviews. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of like technical details on AI note takers. So I'm a big fan of pen and paper personally. And then I can go back and add stuff. I can note someone's tone of voice. I can note who was talking. I can say, OK, they weren't interested in this. And I can pick up more details than an AI note taker could. So AI note takers, very, very helpful. But you have to get a security re review from your company. You have to get consent of everyone. And uh, you can't note little things like this person was not interested in the technical details. This person was. So um, just wanted to call that out really quick because uh, I saw that in the chat. But OK, going back to our stakeholder interview. Um, so we've discussed the check boxes. I like that idea. Um, I think you've done your research really well on this. And we can use the automations for this. but. Uh, we also want to make sure that uh, we're matching the, the end user experience so that your uh, your franchisees are matching the experience with the previous CRM as well as the new Salesforce CRM. So is there anything else that, uh, that you would like to call out as a pain point today or is there anything else that you would like to mention? Yeah, uh, so I think the last thing is that part of the benefits that we give our oncoming uh, franchise owners is something that gives them a lot of autonomy in their new business. So I want to be able to give all of the franchise managers the edit, the admin edit all permission so that when they go into their org, they really have ownership of the business and they can work closely, obviously, with the technical team on their end, just to make sure that, you know, those that are in Dubai can feature the elixir of evening P&E. I'm sorry. <laughs> so pro tip, don't laugh. I'm laughing at the chat. I would never do this in a client meeting, but y'all are y'all are cracking me up. Y'all are so funny. <laughs> I need I needed a break, but yes, I'm also laughing at the chat. <laughs> right. But the franchise owners want the ownership of their business. They want to be able to feature the candles that are most relevant for their region. And really, I think it'll help them to step into that leadership role and ultimately help the brand if they have that ownership over their Salesforce instance. And obviously, you know, they're going to have to work with the technical admin, but really just like giving it to them as a gift. That's something that we've offered to them already, which I hope is okay. I assumed would be fine, but let me know. So like it was called out, Emily says in the chat, horror story in one sentence, all we want to uh, make sure we are using the principle of least privilege as Leonard said, uh, the principle of least privilege means you give people the amount of permissions they need to do their job and that's it so my thought process here y'all had me busting up laughing in the chat i would never bust up laughing in a client call well uh sometimes it's appropriate sometimes you want to laugh at the jokes and be like amenable and friendly but um you would never bust up laughing like i just did uh y'all are killing me in the chat but okay so Principles of least privilege is something that I'm going to explain to Rosemary. We are also going to say uh, the security risks of the possibility of having a franchisee have all of the access to edit everything. So one of the things I am going to do is explain that, you know, if you have an aggrieved end user that uh, they decide they want to quit, they can take all of your data with them. So they can go ahead and start a spinoff business and use your Salesforce stuff because they have access to everything inside. So that's something that I am going to uh, explain. Uh, yeah, we don't want to accidentally destroy, uh, destroy the mainframe as uh, <laughs> what Marissa calls out. Y'all are killing me today. Y'all are so funny. But um, so there's, there's inherent security risks here. We also want to call out that with the franchisee, because we have the central uh, Salesforce model, um, we're, it's likely a hub and spoke model where, again, this is a technical detail that um, I would talk to the architect about, I would talk to the developer about, I would not necessarily talk to Rosemary about. We are gonna say, okay, 
if we have the hub and spoke model where we have a central Salesforce org and then each of the franchisees has their own Salesforce org around the hub and spoke model. So it's like each Salesforce org points in, which is why it's called the hub and spoke model. But uh, we have the, that's probably the most likely scenario here. There's also a possibility where we have just one big Salesforce org that all of the franchisees log into. So uh, depending on the fiscal capabilities of the company, um, Hub and Spoke is the most likely for a big, huge company, but Rosemary is scaling her business right now. She's starting to have franchisees. It's possible that they only have one Salesforce org. So uh, it, it's important to emphasize to Rosemary that we want to make sure that uh, if someone edits a flow, it's not going to bork all of the flows, technical term borking. Um, it's not going to mess up the flows that are happening elsewhere for other franchisees. So uh, this is really important to, uh, to emphasize the security risks, the principles of least privilege, and all of that good stuff to say, okay, the, if we give access edit all to your uh to the members within your role hierarchy there is a possibility that they can run off with your data the other thing that i would like to call out is because we have the emphasis of the role hierarchy here we have the uh ceo and then we have our franchisees we have our managers we have our uh our sales down at the bottom presumably of our were our role hierarchy uh, we are going to uh, emphasize that we can give our uh, our managers and our franchisees more access to stuff. They can build their own reports. They can uh, they can make adjustments to things, and we can do that within the role hierarchy and sharing and visibility settings in our Salesforce work. Uh, we have about seven minutes left, so I'm going to cut to Rachel so we can wrap on up. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's what I would. Uh, be recommending is uh, sharing and viz settings, privileges of uh, privileges of lease permissions, and uh, making sure that folks don't run off with data. Okay, and then my follow up question would be, well, we already told our franchise owners that this was going to be part of it. Like, there's no contracts that have been signed or anything. But uh, yeah, how would you recommend we explain that to them? <laughs> So this is something that uh, a lot of stakeholders will actually get. The, I've actually been asked very similar questions to this. So how, how do I explain that I'm taking someone's access away? And this is something that I've had to actually do in a job where uh, an end user used to be able to create their own stuff and now they can't. And they're really mad about it because we had to crack down on SOX regulations and remove people's privileges. So. This is a uh, question that we have to do to say, uh, this is, it's definitely a difficult subject to bring up. Nobody likes being told that they can't have the access that they used to have, but we have to explain that for the security of the company that we have to reduce these privileges to make sure that our, you know, uh, keep it secret, keep it safe. We want to make sure that we are uh, keeping our, trade secrets safe. We want to make sure that we are promoting a good, cohesive end user experience for all end users, regardless of what franchise they are in. And we want to standardize that process that we have, uh, that you have worked so hard to build. Okay. So I could just tell them it's not going to cut down on your autonomy. We're just really making sure that things stay safe and that we don't break your system. And it, it, it's, it's actually going to be okay. Uh, you're not going to lose out on anything. I think they'll be understanding of that. Okay. Well, Evelyn, the Evelyn, and Rachel, the Rachel, are now back in the house. <laughs> Take a little breather and go into some Q&A. Everyone, it's been awesome to have your engagement as we've gone throughout this session. Really, really, really interesting and lots of learnings just from that. Wendy has a question in the Q&A of how would you handle an overall happy client that has an important stakeholder who is struggling with new features, which let's say is needed for something vital like data management, is which is frustrating. How do you handle one-off opinions within a company? 
oh, this is something that happens all the time with end users. And this is a situation I have ran into both as a consultant and a staff developer. So one of the big things is with user adoption, you want to make sure that you are starting with your power users first. So the people who really love Salesforce, the people who are good at Salesforce, the people who are your power users of Salesforce, and you want to roll out new features to them first, have them test it, have them give feedback and, uh, you know, if the checkboxes or the radio buttons aren't necessarily working, you want to make sure that you find that out before you roll out to uh, the loudest stakeholders that might not necessarily like the new changes. We also want to make sure that there is buy-in from all of your end users and stakeholders. And a way to do that is to solicit feedback. And this is something that should happen before you start building, honestly. Um, if, if you have had a situation where you have already built it, you've got someone who's loudly complaining, um, I'll get on how to handle that in a second. But generally, you want to make sure that you are soliciting feedback from your end users at all parts of the process. So this is going to have something like user acceptance testing. We're going to sit with our end users, see how they do their job and all that good stuff. And we want to make sure we're incorporating that feedback as we go. If you haven't had the chance to incorporate that feedback until the very end, we want to make sure that we are tailoring our end user training to be something that's helpful and useful for them. And we want to make sure that our end users understand that this is for the good of the company and we understand there's a learning curve. There is always a learning curve and we want to try and break down that learning curve as much as possible. So this is going to be uh, providing trainings. We are going to do lunch and learns. We're going to do knowledge shares. We're going to do knowledge transfer and we're going to build that buy in and uh, try and make it a little less frustrating for everyone. Amazing. Amazing. OK, next question is from Marissa. This will be fun. Have you ever had to deal with an especially rowdy stakeholder who was verbally unhappy or negative about all the ideas and solutions that you presented. How did you navigate that? Oh, this is okay. When I said at the start, don't take it personally. This is something that's actually happened. I have been cussed at. I have been sworn at. I have been like, I, I've had unfortunately had these experiences. And this is something that, again, don't take it personally. One of the philosophies I try to live by is don't mess with people's money. Uh, when you are implementing new processes, uh, we want to emphasize that uh, not only is this the best practice, this is the way that's going to save you money. And uh, by let me think on this for a second. Again, that phrase, let me think on this for a second. I paused. I'm going to think on this for a second. Let me think of how to phrase this is another good one. But this is something that uh, you really have to not take it personally. And then you also have to present the uh, happy user story to say, OK, this is the best practice. This is the way that's going to allow you to work with your Salesforce contract. This is the way that is going to save you the most money. And this is going to make your end users the happiest. So there's also some room for collaboration and compromise here. But if you have the uh, negative reaction to the ideas and solutions, um, sometimes, oh gosh, I'm going to say something goofy. As, as a woman, I have had some very combative male uh, folks. And unfortunately, some of you will have probably relate to this where uh, men are stereotypically more technical, whereas women are stereotypically not. And uh, sometimes getting another colleague to present the ideas as well will help. And then um, if that doesn't happen, find a way to compromise and incorporate stakeholder ideas into yours as well. So um, I, I just want to call that out. Um, if you have had an experience, stakeholder can be combative. Um, like I said, I've been cussed at, I've been sworn at, I've had mean things said. Don't take it personally. Emphasize the positives and compromise where you can. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for calling that out. And, you know, having other people present or having someone like back you up in a sense of we're coming in here as a team and we're having shared ideas that can also help to just 
ease the tension and help everyone to get on the same page so that it's not just one to one like we're having a battle but almost like like a collaborative a collaborative thing that is happening here so with that everyone i know we've got tons more questions in the chat what i'm going to do is go through and collect all of them and see if i can go through the transcript of this session and find specific answers to those because there's some really great questions amazing 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 golden nuggets that we have had here evelyn if you could tell us your uh top two takeaways in two sentences what would they be <laughs> two sentences turn off slack turn off your notifications pay attention take notes and have fun with it we're all in this together we are all a team and stakeholders can be frustrating combative stressful honestly like i get stressed out i was stressed out about this today but have fun with it um you are the expert in the room you're in and just know that and own it so hopefully this was helpful have a great wednesday y'all uh, this was so helpful and so fun thank you evelyn for being with us today and all of you for participating with us if you haven't already filled out that feedback form go ahead and do that and stay tuned in the Slack channel for the recording as well as that question rundown. I'll post that soon. So with that, everyone, happy Wednesday and we'll see you later. Bye, everyone. Bye.